Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham and this is Biochemistry One. The purpose of this segment is to take the first major steps toward mastery of a class of catalysts, a class of enzymes called proteases. They are what they sound like. They are things that degrade polypeptides. Many of them are digestive enzymes, for example, and a couple of the ones that we'll talk about are enzymes that are operating in your GI tract and mine as we speak to digest the food that we eat. So our larger purpose here is to understand the major class of molecular machines that make all of life, all of biochemistry possible. These are the molecular machines that execute catalysis. Remember again, as we've said before, the fundamental point of catalysis is to allow the desirable reactions, the reactions that work to support the replication of the vehicle, to support the function of biological systems, to go blindingly fast, so fast that side reactions, uh, uh, undesirable side reactions form a negligible component of biological chemistry of biochemistry. And remember the fundamental way in which catalysts work. They reduce the activation energy of the reaction. Remember the sharply exponential effect on rate of reducing the activation energy, the uh, delta G double dagger of the reaction, as we've talked about extensively in earlier segments. And what else do they do? They position reactive groups on the enzyme amino acid side chains in exactly the right position to drive extremely rapid reaction. It's as if you could take reaction components in a tube and drive their concentrations to virtually virtual infinity, something of course you can't actually do. So evolution by natural selection, by its patient trial and error, hunting and seeking, uh, arrives at a, a configuration of amino acids that will bind a substrate in a particular way, usually idiosyncratic to the particular enzyme. We've talked about earlier examples. We'll see some more today and at the same time positioning side chains to contribute to the, the uh, um, often hydrogen ions or abstracting hydrogen ions from the reaction as you'll see uh, today uh, with the effect being that the uh, concentration of reactants as I said is, is spectacular, the effective concentration is spectacularly high so that these reactions go blindingly rapidly as we, again as we've seen before many 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 orders of magnitude faster than they would go spontaneously so let's look at a, the first of a series of uh, proteases that we're going to look at today this is carboxypeptidase A and we look at this one because it's a fairly well characterized enzyme it's a digestive enzyme your pancreas is releasing it into the your upper duodenum to support digestion again as we speak and uh, it but some of its properties are illuminating about how some enzymes go about the business of catalysis. So this is a simple little cartoon which illustrates Dan Koshland's induced fit model, which we now believe is characteristic of a, of a subset of enzymes. Notice the two arms sticking out here with the A and B and C groups on them. Notice the substrate S as it binds to the enzyme. These arms embrace it. They, they surround it and juxtapose the A, B, and C groups uh, 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 intimately with the substrate. In fact, carboxypeptidase A appears to be an example of an enzyme that uses induced fit to precisely position these reactive uh, side chains amino acid side chains, they're going to help drive the reaction. Uh, not, as you'll see, not only amino acid side chains, some other things that will emerge in just a moment. So in fact, this is the, uh, a, a simple little diagram of the hydrolysis of an uh, a, a experimental substrate, one that looks like the real substrate. Remember what uh, carboxypeptidase A does from our er much earlier uh, conversations about the sequencing of polypeptides. It cleaves off the uh, carboxy terminal residue if that residue is um, if that residue is aromatic as diagrammed here. Notice the C terminal aromatic group. This is the amino acid that's going to be released by the enzyme. It's an exopeptidase. It comes in from the C terminal end releasing a single amino acid. Notice also these three amino acids, GLUT270, ARG145, and tyrosine248. These three enzyme side chains embrace the substrate as it comes in. In other words, the, the uh, polypeptide segments on which these amino acids reside change configuration and effectively embrace the substrate as the substrate enters the active side of the enzyme. As you'll see, they're also going to play really important roles in catalysis. Let me call your attention to you see the green uh, uh, bonds. These are hydrogen or in one case ionic bonds between the substrate and these amino acid side chains which are now precisely positioning the substrate to undergo subsequent chemistry. So again, an analogy we've used before, it's a little like the, like the assembly of an automobile on a robotic uh, assembly line. Everything has to be just exactly right, but if it is, boom, 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 everything goes really fast. 
that's how enzyme catalysis one of the ways in which it works okay so let's now look at the uh, steps in catalysis by carboxypeptidase a first notice that the the specificity is determined by a hydrophobic binding pocket you can see at the top of this diagram here there's a little pocket into which uh, a residue like a phenylalanine or a tyrosine as shown here will slide and sit and then arginine 145 makes an ionic bond with a positively charged carboxylic acid group in other words imposing the carboxy terminal requirement on substrate. So you have a, you're required to be uh, carboxy terminal and you're required to have an a aromatic or, or at least highly uh, hydrophobic side chain. All right. Now let's look at the roles of these key amino acid side chains, which remember now have swept in, they've swept in to embrace the uh, amino acids, uh, 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 the, uh, the substrate. So firstly, tyrosine 248 is going to, is, uh, that proton is slightly acidic, and that proton is being donated to hydrolyze, begin the process of hydrolysis of the polypeptide bond, leading to the release of the first product, as you can see here at the lower right. But at the same time, notice that uh, glutamine 270, another of these amino acids that rotated into position to surround and embrace the substrate, is now attacking the extremely uh, electrophilic um, carb carbonyl carbon that is in a zinc coordination complex. So this is in fact a zinc metalloenzyme. This is a, uh, a, pep a peptide which requires zinc as a cofactor. So in this case, zinc is forming a coordination complex with the carbonyl oxygen you can see in the red circle at the right. That's making this carbon extremely hydrophilic. And now the carboxylic acid group from glutamate, glutamate 270 will attack it, forming the covalent enzyme substrate bond that you see below. So this is a case in which an, uh, an enzyme forms a transient covalent bond with the substrate in the process of catalysis. So the energetics of this reaction are such that the proton that was donated a moment ago to drive hydrolysis provides part of the driving force of the reaction, but this attack on the uh, highly electrophilic carbonyl carbon is the other force driving the release of this first release, of the initial release of the product. But it leaves you with a covalent enzyme substrate complex, which you have to deal with, otherwise you've killed your enzyme. So in fact now, the same tyrosine that acted as an acid a moment ago is now going to turn around and act as a base. And it's going to withdraw a proton from water, producing a hydroxyl group, which will now attack that uh, uh, labile bond and release the second product. So take some time to look around this relatively simple reaction uh, diagram, get comfortable with it. Notice its properties. Acid-base catalysis in a precisely positioned substrate and the transient formation of an enzyme substrate covalent bond, sometimes called covalent catalysis. So we have acid-base catalysis, covalent catalysis, and we have metal ion catalysis in the sense that the zinc ion bound by this protein forms a source of coordination to both orient the carbonyl carbon that you can see at the upper right here and in fact to withdraw electrons from it to exaggerate the electrophilic nature of that carbonyl carbon which is going to be attacked here. Okay. Again, notice what's happened here. We have specific amino acids that are going to stick their fingers in here and drive very rapid uh, uh, reaction rates by creating a, a stupendously high local concentration of reactants, in this case, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen ions or basic groups. Um, and they do so by embracing, physically embracing the substrate when it enters the enzyme. This is a classic example of induced fit. Let's turn attention now to another proteus, chymotrypsin, which is an example of a whole group of proteins, uh, proteases called serine proteases. Uh, most of them are all descendants of a single ancestral enzyme. I'll remind you of that again in a few minutes, so that they are homologous. That is, they use the same amino acids to do the same thing because they're all descendant from this, uh, a common ancestor that started out that way. But there's evidence looking at archaeal and bacterial and eukaryotic enzymes that, in fact, the same catalytic mechanisms, the so-called catalytic triad, which I'll call your attention to in just a minute, has evolved at least once independently so that, in fact, this same trick was discovered two different times by evolution, by natural selection. It's obviously a really good trick. 